Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Benning, and here I am on the uh, CSC's first live streaming session. So uh, I hope everybody's doing well and, uh, you know, staying in and keeping active and keeping mentally uh, fit during this time of, uh, you know, self-isolation. It's, it's kind of a tricky time to, uh, to kind of keep yourself uh, mentally engaged, but, you know, I, I believe that it's a, it's a great time to be uh, doing new things, um, hence, you know, us doing these live streams. It's a new idea that we had as Christine and I were working on uh, the website, the new CSC website in the last little while. Uh, we had this idea to, um, to do a live stream to kind of give people an update on what the CSC is up to and also uh, you know, provide like an interactive platform for uh, other cinematographers. So there will be more of these in the future. I'm sort of the guinea pig right now doing the first one, uh, but there will be more uh, coming up. So uh, what I wanted to, uh, I guess, first talk about is uh, I shall show you this, which is the CSC's uh, email, which Christina has. And if you have any questions that come up in the next little while, you can uh, you can send them there, or to Christina, who's uh, following the uh, the threads uh, right here. Um, switch over to my little note screen here. So why don't I first talk about the uh, the gala, our, our the 63rd annual CSC awards, which would have been on uh, on the 4th of April which of course, due to the uh, pandemic, uh, we, we postponed. Uh, now the plan is still to have the gala. Uh, obviously we don't know a date yet, but we are looking at doing it um, potentially in the fall. Uh, we'd like to sort of have it as a thing that once everything is, is over with, uh, we have something to celebrate obviously. And uh, that is the plan uh, currently is to continue to have the gala uh, in, the, in the fall. So that's still the, uh, the idea. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about was uh, just, I guess, now that, um, you know, the last election that we had in the fall, uh, there's some new board members, uh, myself on the CSC board, uh, Guy Godfrey, Kristen Fieldhouse, um, Serge DeRosier is uh, a newer board member from the last year. We have Zoe Durse, uh, Joan Hutton, Carlos Estevez, and George Willis, our president. And of course, uh, Susan Saranchuk and uh, Patty, as our admins, are still uh, keeping things going with us. And, you know, things are still happening uh, while we're uh, isolating ourselves, uh, basically kind of thing. Um, so we had the election in November. Uh, a bunch of us uh, were elected, uh, the, the three new uh, members. And that kind of came from, um, in the last year or so, George Willis, our president, had this idea of a president's committee, which was basically to bring together, um, you know, interested members in uh, being involved in the society. Uh, to have these sort of like think tank discussions. And we had several of them over many months, which uh, I, guess, I think inspired a bunch of us to run for the board. Um, and the members that are on the board uh, now who are new are, are members of that president's uh, committee. And uh, one of the first things that we sort of started talking about um, when, we were, when we got into the, uh, into the board was, okay, uh, and in the president's committee was the idea of, of starting up a new website. So we, we worked on building a new website over the last year. It's still in the works, um, but it's been, a great, um, it's been a great thing for uh, us to work on in the, in, the, uh, in the downtime. And it's still in the works. We're hoping in the next month or so it'll be up. I'm gonna show a little sneak peek at that in a bit, but um, it's something that uh, I think kind of takes the best of the old site, which is still active and will um, you know, improve upon uh, what we have as uh, as our site, um, you know, kind of try, trying to keep uh, current with events so that there's an easy way for people to keep up on uh, on, on current uh, events and screenings and that kind of thing. So here I'm showing on the Instagram feed, this is the, the, the homepage of the new website. Uh, it's not fully working yet, but I can kind of give you an idea of what it will be. Um, so here we have, um, this is like a private link, it's not actually public yet so it's you can't really see it but um, here is sort of the home page which would have uh, you know the, these three icons here would be upcoming events right now these are all uh, temporary of course um, but there are several uh, icons there there's three and they'll, they'll cycle through as new events come through uh, if I scroll down you can see we've got this section here is basically a direct feed from our Instagram uh, our Instagram account 
which of course has done very well. I think we have 43,000 followers on Instagram now, which, you know, in the last few years, it's gone from um, a few hundred in the last five years to now 43,000. And that's, uh, you know, largely thanks to Carolyn Wong, who's been running that. Uh, Carolyn uh, is the person who has been uh, curating it and basically bringing in our, our full members to host uh, the account every couple of weeks. So currently, right now, it's Barry Perel, uh, CSC. He's, uh, he's posting his images daily. Uh, so the idea here on the new site is that there would be a feed of the uh, CSC's Instagram account showing up here. So you'd see uh, current, um, the latest images would, be, would keep cycling through, basically. Um, and then if I scroll down further, here we have uh, the magazine section. Right now it's showing uh, four of the same uh, cover, but the idea would be is that it would be the last four issues would be shown of the magazine. And uh, maybe I should talk a bit about that because for people who aren't familiar with the CSC, um, as the Canadian Society of Cinematographers, one of the benefits of, of being a member is, uh, of course, all the events that are scheduled, uh, the workshops that we hold, um, mentorship and seminars for new equipment. But we also have our uh, print magazine, which is here. So there's, there's an actual, this is the latest edition, uh, Batwoman by Robert McLaughlin uh, as the DP is on the cover there. I'll show it over here. That's, that's the new magazine. And uh, this is, there's 10 issues of that a year. So part of being a member, of course, is you get this magazine, which, uh, you know, is, is quite insightful. It's got a lot of great information in it. Um, so that on the website will be the, uh, where the magazine would be seen. And for members, you could download a, uh, the PDF of it as well from there. Uh, so if I go back to the top, there will uh, be a section of a membership directory. So if I click on this, um, what you'll end up getting is a uh, like an alphabetical listing of all of our members. So here is basically everybody who's a member uh, ranks. Of course, we have different membership types. So if I if I click here, you can see we have associate, affiliate, full life, companion, associate life, and so on. You can you can browse by membership type uh, or by everybody, and you'll be able to search by name here. And every one of these links, every one of these names, uh, the idea being is that we would you would be able to click on that, and it would take you to uh, that person's website or IMDb page. Right now, we are thinking that um, the old site had like a list of like uh, a, a, a reel that was hosted there and a lot of different uh, information. It got quite kind of uh, I guess difficult to manage that and kind of. Um, I guess you could say a bit messy. And of course it gets dated because then people have to keep coming back and updating their, their work. Uh, the thinking behind this new way of having a listing is uh, basically that everyone kind of has their own website or Vimeo page. Um, and that kind of thing, you know, people maintain their own work in that sense. So it's better that we have a link to someone's own website where they can maintain their own, uh, their own reels and, and work. So that was the thinking behind this. But right now there's everybody is in here. Uh, and once the site goes live, uh, we're going to ask that um, that members do check this to make sure that the link that's here is the link they want for uh, their work as, um, you know, whatever that may be, a Vimeo link, their agent's uh, website, their uh, work, whatever that is. Um, so we want to make sure that, that uh, th that's accurate. So when it's up, you know, we'll let everybody know and then please check it and uh, you can then change uh, your, your listing. Um, there will of course be, um, there'll be a page that will have media on the site, which will be all of our podcasts and uh, videos such as the Q and A's from our screenings, workshop videos. Uh, that's a whole separate section. Um, photo galleries from events. Um, there's a section here specifically for the awards, which uh, if I go here, you'll be able to enter the awards here. Uh, all the different uh, categories are, are here. Um, here's an example of a photo gallery from the awards. This is a, the new Envisionist Award, which was uh, uh, unveiled last year. So that's uh, obviously going to be featured on the site. And what else? There's the magazine page, which will take you back to the magazine. And then all the contact information, um, which will direct you to the various um, email addresses on, of the CSC. So that's what we're working on as far as the new website. Let me just jump ahead. So let me just talk about the screenings for a minute. Um, I, it, we didn't really have a chance to announce this, but um, we had actually had a screening. We had these, you know, the, the Abyss screening 
and the Jurassic Park screening in the last year or so, where uh, Mikhail Solomon uh, came up uh, as the cinematographer for The Abyss, uh, and uh, Dean Cundy came up for the Jurassic Park, and we had a great screening at the TIFF Lightbox with him, and we had, uh, with both of those DPs, and we had a, um, a great Q&A afterwards that Arthur Cooper uh, moderated. Um, and what was interesting about that is it really brought together our community, and we heard a lot of people say, we want to do more of these, how do we get more involved? Um, so we had lined up, we actually had a screening committee formed uh, for some of our sponsors and uh, CSC members who were involved with, um, uh, you know, screening uh, basically by, uh, you know, this sort of the idea of bringing together more people. So we had, the, the, the committee was formed to start more of these and we ended up with uh, the next screening being Ellen Curis. So Ellen Curis was gonna come up in April to do uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which we had scheduled for April 25th, but unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, we had to cancel it, sadly. Um, so hopefully we can reschedule that at a future date. What we have lined up is in, um, in September, we have uh, Mark Irwin, CSC and ASC, uh, lined up to do, um, Mark Irwin is lined up to do The Fly at the TIFF Lightbox. So the same idea where he would come in, uh, we would scream, we'd have a Q&A, which is great because you know Mark's roots are are here in, in Toronto, so he gets to come back and see some of his uh, his old friends and uh, and talk about uh, making that film, which of course is a classic uh, science fiction film. So that's that's something that we're hoping, you know, all things willing, that in September uh, we can still do that, and that's that's the idea that in September uh, we continue the screening uh, process and and also hopefully uh, the awards gala. Um, so I have a couple questions coming in here from Christina. Um, Peter is asking, will members be searchable by region? Uh, yes, that's possible. Uh, we have to, we're still building that um, part of the site. So that is uh, something we've, we've looked into and we can, we can further explore that. Um, here, I'm gonna switch back to this so people can see me. There we go. Uh, Justin is asking, will listings for affiliates, associates and full members or just full members? No. Uh, it will be broken down as a, as a full list of everybody by last name, but you can also search by category. So you could search by just full members, associates, um, affiliates, and so on. Uh, so there will be a drop down menu that you can choose uh, which category you want to search within. So uh, yes, yes to that, uh, Justin. Um, there's another uh, interesting thing I want to talk about uh, for um, members, which is a new thing that we've, that we've kind of just worked out in the last couple of months. But a lot of you are probably familiar with Arthur J. Gallagher, formerly uh, Unionville Insurance, formerly CG&B Group. Uh, many of us as cinematographers have our, our equipment insured through, uh, through Arthur Gallagher. And uh, we've, we've, the CSC has always been involved with Arthur Gallagher to insure uh, workshops and that kind of thing. But now what we're doing is um, we were sort of adding additional insurance to uh, the CSC um, admin and board, and that started this discussion with uh, people at uh, at Arthur Gallagher, um, asking about um, talking about the idea of offering discounts to our members, which is something that hadn't really been discussed before. So, uh, what will be happening, and this will be a part of the new site, um, there will be a discount offered to uh, CSC members uh, who are either new clients of Arthur Gallagher or existing clients. Um, there's now a new email address set up, which I will show, and Christina also has it. But this email address here, there we go. Boop. And over here. So that email address uh, will be the email that's been set up specifically by Stephen Bordelon at uh, Arthur Gallagher. Um, and if you're, a, if you're a CSC member, you can contact them and discuss the discounts. They're, they're offering kind of 10 to 20% discounts. It's still kind of in the works. but um, it's, uh, it's a very cool thing. It's the first time that we've been able to do that. And, I, and we all think it's a great value added uh, service as being a CSC member. Cause I know a lot of us uh, own equipment. A lot of us have insurance. Uh, and if you don't, and you own a lot of equipment, you probably should have insurance uh, on your gear. So that's, uh, of course they offer um, also, uh, you know, commercial business insurance as well. So that's a great new thing that, uh, that we have coming out. It'll be linked on the new website as well. Uh, but as I said, uh, that email address here, which is uh, ggb.cscmembers at ajg.com. So grab that screen there. That's, that's what it is. 
So that's exciting. Uh, actually, here's a, something fun. Here, look. Here's a picture of us as the new board. There we are. Look at us. We're all happy. So this is in the newest uh, version of the magazine right there. Camera two, cut the camera one, camera two. There we go. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next thing. So the awards. The awards, uh, obviously there's a lot of nominations um, and I, I was on the jury and I have to say that the work is excellent. I've been on the jury for the last number of years and I have to say that um, the the quality of the work is is always getting better and the student work was unbelievable this year like the quality of the student work is just like crazy really good uh i was i looked at i think about 10 categories uh that I, I judged on and one thing i wanted to talk about with the the jury process which was interesting is you know we switched to vimeo a few years ago because you know there was a discussion from the west coast from vancouver uh members that um you know they didn't feel that they could participate because in the past all of our jury process was done um, via uh, the, the clubhouse, which is at, currently at, uh, at William F. White's. Um, that's where the CSC's headquarters is. And uh, you know that's where we would have these meetings where we would all gather as a group for each category and we would, we would have a big monitor set up and we would talk about, um, you know, we would discuss the, each entry and we'd have this group discussion about the work and it was sort of a collaborative discussion. And a lot of our, our members who were on the, these juries really enjoyed that process. but the flip side of that is that it left out the people who are on the West Coast, so uh, or anywhere else in Canada for that matter, who weren't in Ontario. So uh, we switched over to a Vimeo uh, uh, idea in the last couple of years where we could allow people to see uh, the work anywhere in Canada and vote on the work anywhere in Canada, um, which is great, but it takes away that kind of discussion process of being with your peers and looking at work and getting to appreciate the work and discuss it. So. What was interesting is this year, um, Brendan Stacy and Guy Godfrey and Boris Mazarovsky and a few of us were talking about the idea of like, wouldn't it be great if we got together uh, at someone's house and we have like a group um, jury process to kind of bring back that, that group discussion process of the work. And, you know, it, it's a time for us to see each other as cinematographers to talk about the, uh, you know, the state of, of the work in the industry um, and looking at, at people's work. So that's what we did. We did that this year. We got together over two nights. We all chose categories that obviously that none of us were entered into. So we were, there was no conflict there. Um, but we we did the we had this process where we sat. Uh, we did it at my place one night and at Boris's place the other night. And we sat and we basically looked at um, you know at the various entries. And it was a, it was a really great process that it brought us together. It, it allowed us to appreciate the work, discuss the work, the techniques, you know, uh, styles that we were seeing. Um, you know, you learn from that. You really, as a, as a cinematographer, when you watch these entries, it's a great process of learning about the work that's out there. Um, I think everyone who's a full member who has the ability to vote and to be on these juries should try it if you haven't done it already. I've done it for a few years now. Um, and we were saying that like next year, we should try and coordinate this more and do another one of these group meetings where we get together and discuss uh, the work. I mean, it's, it's a really great process. So we're, we're hoping uh, to continue to do that. And I thought it'd be nice to share that with with uh, with all of you because we haven't really talked about it um, really outside of our own circles. But you know, we would encourage people to do that across the country, get together and have you know uh, viewing parties. Maybe next year it'll be like a Zoom thing where we have um, you know you could get together as groups. You have you watch the Vimeo links and then you get together on a Zoom chat and you all can then discuss the work uh, through Zoom. So it, it hope you know the idea is to bring the country together, bring us more together as a society because. Obviously, we have large spaces between us, and with the CSC being based in Ontario, you know, we don't want to have people who are outside of that region feel they're, they're not part of the process. So, um, you know, we can keep doing that kind of thing. I think that'll be, that'll be great, you know, as a, as a continuation of the awards next year. Um, moving along. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the diversity committee. Uh, there's been a few new committees that we've started up in the last... Uh, uh, few months, um, one of which is a diversity committee, uh, which is basically to, you know, recognize that 
the CC has a role in, in giving women more of a place, uh, you know, minorities, uh, people that are, are underrepresented in the, the cinematography community. Um, so there's a committee now that is basically looking at ways to, to um, make, have us be more involved in that way. And one of the ideas currently is a, a, um, like a, a women's in film workshop, women in film workshop, where it would be taught by uh, women cinematographers, open to everybody, but, but run by uh, a, you know, a female team. And uh, you know, hopefully making that a more of an inclusive environment for women who maybe feel you know, um, uh, a little bit intimidated by going to a, a workshop run by men kind of thing. So these are discussions that are, are happening and uh, it's in the works. And obviously when we get back up and running and the world kind of continues to, to go about its business, these are the things we're working on, um, you know, in the in the probably in the fall. And the the committee is is uh, is one of those things. Uh, okay, another question here. Uh, is it Eli or Ellie? Eli is asking, uh, will podcasts be available on Spotify slash Apple Podcasts? Yes, the answer is yes, and I'll get to that. Uh, we do have all the podcasts on Spotify. Or, sorry, not Spotify, but we have them on SoundCloud. And uh, we will expand them further, but right now we, we currently have everything on SoundCloud. I'm going to talk a little bit about our, um, you know, the relationship we have with our sponsors. Uh, the CSC is, survives and, and operates and uh, works in partnership with our sponsors. We have, you know, 30 plus sponsors from all different types of uh, levels of the industry. And we really uh, depend and work with our sponsors because they are what keep us going. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to work on in the next year and the next coming months is the idea of reaching out to our sponsors with a, with a survey that would be kind of a one-on-one -on -one survey. We would talk to them about their uh, input and feedback about the CSC, which we can kind of take all that information, formulate a roadmap uh, for our, our future. And the next few years, it's something that we feel strongly we should, we need to have. And it, uh, it's something that needs to be done in conjunction with our sponsors. Uh, and that's something we're going to be working on very soon. So if you're a sponsor and you're watching this right now, uh, expect to hear from us in the coming uh, weeks or week or two. Uh, we'd like to take advantage of this, this slow time, this downtime to do these kinds of things, to be involved and to have these conversations while we have this time. So when we come out to the other side, we've made use of this time that we are uh, obviously all um, dealing with and, and, and kind of stuck with. So we might as well make use of it. And one of those things is having these conversations with our, um, with our sponsors. So that's, that's coming for sure. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the mentor program. And if you look at the new uh, magazine, there's actually a little article about it there. Uh, mentor program, here it is, right there. So this is something that uh, has, the CSC has been doing for a while, uh, maybe kind of quietly, and maybe wasn't that known about. But it is something that we are we are actively doing and we actually want to kind of ramp it up and and um maybe retool it slightly but this is something that you know we want to uh offer to affiliate associate members uh where if you want to uh basically mentor with a full member uh then you should reach out to the to the admin and again to this so send you know send an email there say that you're interested in the mentorship program and what that would mean would be, you know, partnering with a, uh, a working DP, a, a full member DP so, uh, of some sort where you can, uh, who's obviously in your region, where you can, uh, you know, learn on set or the prep process, whatever that may entail. It's a bit of a fluid thing, but we, we definitely want to have uh, more of that. And that's something that we're going to be working on uh, in the next little while. So if you're interested in, in a mentorship kind of program, reach out through that email address and, um, and over the little next little bit, as we kind of work through things, um, that'll be on our agenda to formulate uh, a plan for that. So send in your your names if you're interested, and uh, and we'll kind of we'll work uh, to get back to you with a plan to um, partner you with somebody. I should also talk about Amago. Uh, right before the pandemic kicked in, uh, George Willis, our president, uh, went uh, to Europe for the uh, he went to Belgium for Amago. Um, Amago is uh, partnered with us. Let me just show quickly. I'll show you the. Uh, there is the new um, our sort of SoundCloud uh, podcast account. Uh, these will all be mirrored to the new website. So the new website will have them mirrored here. But this is our all of our podcasts going back like many years. 
they're all here, uh, all available on SoundCloud. So that link Christina has, she can share with everybody. Um, and I'm going to talk slightly about in the relation to the podcast, as far as this series goes of these discussions, the idea is that, uh, in the next few weeks, while we all have the time, uh, every Thursday, we're going to have another, uh, cinematographer or cinematographers take this platform that I'm on right now on both Instagram and Facebook and, um, host, uh, this account. So the next, uh, the next guests of this, uh, of this stream will be Boris Majofsky and Brandon Stacy. And I have up on the SoundCloud account right now, Boris Majofsky's podcast, which he and I did together last year, which kind of talks about the idea of alternating DPs and what is that like alternating as, uh, as a DP on, um, on a, uh, on a series. So they're going to take over next week and do it together and basically uh, host and talk about what it's like working together as co-DP. So expect to see that um, Expect to see that next week. Thursday at 1 o'clock is the time. Uh, there'll be ads for that coming up. Uh, I'm just bringing up the next bunch of questions. There we go. Um, so if you haven't already heard it, you can listen to Boris's podcast. It, it, will, it, it talks about the things that they're gonna, probably going to talk about next week. Um, but of course, next week's podcast or uh, stream is going to get into more detail because both Brendan and, and Boris can discuss this um, together, which is really great. I think a lot of people have questions um, about alternating. I know I get asked that question a lot with the expanse, um, you know, as far as what it's like to alternate and how that works. So look forward to that uh, with those guys, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, hmm. Sorry, I got distracted. The one thing I didn't finish my thought there was uh, Imago. So let me go back over here to the Imago link. So that is the Imago website. So George was actually uh, had headed to uh, Belgium, to Brussels, to attend the Imago, um, their, their annual uh, general meeting, or IAGA, they call it, AGM. Um, so he was there to attend that to represent as our president uh, of the CSC with all the other sister societies around the world and uh, with Imago, he was going to attend their annual uh, general meeting and also, um, also to attend the awards which were happening. But unfortunately, all of that, that got uh, canceled. So I thought it'd be a good point to just talk about how the CSC is affiliated with Imago. I'm, I'm showing the website right now on Instagram. Christina can show that too. Um, but uh, that's something that uh, I'm not sure everyone is aware that we are affiliated with. So just to keep that in mind, check out the, the site, see what they're up to. Uh, you know, they are uh, kind of a, a sister organization to ours and the CSC has partnered with them. Um, I have some more notes coming in here from Christina. I will relay those. Uh, okay, two things. Uh, so this is actually on my list of things to talk about. Arthur Cooper has um, created a, a section on the, C, uh, the CSC's Facebook page, which is a, a grouping of links to the work of uh, the nominees from this year's uh, awards gala. It's currently on the CSC's Facebook page. You can scroll through and it's, uh, there's links to uh, people's work, uh, the work that was nominated. So check that out. Um, gives you a good idea of the caliber of work that was entered. And I, and I have to say again, like the work overall is really incredible. There's some really great work being done out there from in all uh, categories. So check that out if you haven't. It's a great way to kind of get a sense of uh, who the nominees are, and now that we have this time that we're waiting to actually have the award show, uh, why not look at the work that has been uh, has been nominated? Um, uh, John Holosko uh, has a little note for me. Um, hi, John. How are you? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the um, the education committee, and maybe I can kind of mention that you know the CSC operates with volunteers. You know, it's a lot of volunteer effort. Um, you have the, the board, the executive board itself, which I'm a member of, uh, but then you've also got all these various committees that, that kind of do the work that makes events happen, like the workshops, um, the screenings, the, uh, you know, the social uh, online content stuff. Um, that's all basically run by uh, committees. We have the awards committee, we have the membership committee, um, and, you know, all the great things you see the CSC doing is because of these volunteers. And, 
you know, I, I really urge that full members, any all members, uh, should if they're interested and have an, uh, you know ideas, they should uh, you know get involved and and be part of these committees because this is how you know things like you're seeing right now. This is how these things these things happen. Um, so uh, we have the education committee, which uh, is basically responsible for all of our workshops and coordinating workshops. Uh, there are workshops that are being um, you know, we had a poll on Facebook back in January asking people what they were interested in as far as workshops. Because we, of course, we have our regular workshops, which are the ones that, uh, you know, the fundamentals, as we call them, the core workshops, which are the intro to lighting, lighting faces, and tabletop workshops, which we just recently had. Uh, Marty uh, Wojtunik coordinated that with Carlos uh, Estevez and George uh, Willis, who taught it. Uh, that was very successful. Um, and those are kind of our core workshops that really are the things that we always do. And we were looking for ways to in introduce um, new um, uh, workshops that are more specialized. And the poll that we had in January, uh, we asked people for some feedback on, on things they're interested in based on ideas that the committee had. And these, uh, these are some of the ideas that we had um, that came up. One of them, the, the top one was nighttime cinematography, the night exterior. You know, it's a question people ask a lot is how to deal with lighting a big exterior scene, especially if you haven't had a chance to do it before. So this is something that seems there's a lot of interest in that. And the idea being that we, um, you know, we bring forward a, um, you know, like a, um, a, basically bring forward like a, a, a night lighting exterior setup where we can bring in either a, a one DP or a couple DPs to talk about how they would handle a night lighting workshop. So that's something on a large scale that we're looking at trying to do in the next, uh, you know, when things get back to normal, that's sort of, it was on the, in the works. Um, so that's something that's been talked about. Um, as I mentioned before, the women in film workshop, that's another one. Um, lighting faces, another one of those. Of course, we have our camera assistance workshops, which are a standard thing the CSC does. Uh, those will come back. Um, Onset coloring, that's another thing that's been brought up a lot, which I'm gonna get into in a bit, talking about uh, grading and, and remote grading. But uh, onset color is something that people uh, ask a lot of questions about and want to know more about. So we're looking at having a, a um, you know, onset li or, or live grading as they would call it uh, workshop. So expect that also uh, coming down the pipe. But as far as what, uh, just to go back to what John was discussing, what John mentioned, uh, yeah, that basically the education committee is in the process of rewriting and updating uh, the CSC's um, curriculums and that will be available online. So these are all the things that are kind of in the works right now as we, um, you know, as we take advantage of our downtime here. Uh, okay, so I've talked about all the CSC stuff uh, that I wanted to cover. Um, again, I will show this email address for anyone who wants to send questions to the CSC as far as like mentorship, there's that. Any of the things you want to ask questions about. And of course, Christine is watching the live feed right now. So if you've got other questions that I haven't answered uh, or want to know more about, please feed them to her and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so let me, let me jump into the live grading, the, or sorry, the remote grading thing. Um, you know, there's a challenge right now, obviously, this whole thing with the pandemic has caused a huge wrench in the gears for a lot of um, a lot of productions. And one of the challenges is, uh, you know, shows that have finished, how do you now color grade them when, you know, most of these post places have shut down? So you've got Deluxe, Technicolor, all these companies are now due to the, you know, the, the uh, restrictions put in place by the government, they have, they're not, they have to shut down basically. So um, with our show, we finished shooting Expanse at the end of February. Thankfully, we finished uh, filming everything, but now of course the post process has begun. Um, and we were due to start color grading um, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of April, roughly, give or take. Um, but uh, now the challenge is that uh, the Deluxe is, has to shut down. So they're working on the process of moving their key per personnel to uh, their homes. So Joanne Rourke is my colorist, the colorist that works with us on Expanse, and she's been with us since the first season and does great work. And, you know, she and I work really closely together. I pretty much color graded every episode that I've, that I've done um, with Joanne. And typically I go in in person, I go in, I sit down and I, we, she and I together work on the episodes. And, you know, as I, as I do that, I'll show you, I'm gonna go back to the, on Instagram here. I'm gonna show 
so here's an example of what I do as far as my workflow when I shoot. So I'm scrolling through a gallery on Flickr, which is what I use, um, that shows basically the stills that my DIT and I create on set. So we live grade, we, um, we set the looks as we're shooting uh, in combination with the lighting. Uh, we're also live grading to set the look for every shot. Um, so I create this gallery of stills, which basically I share with, these are from uh, last season. So I share these with um, my uh, team, with everybody, the production. And of course, Joanne also gets those, those stills. And she and I, um, when we get into the color grading suite, she's taken those stills and the settings we've created on set and has kind of already set up the general look of the show. So when, when we sit down together, it's basically kind of going through and um, finessing it and making it work in terms of the cut. Because as you start seeing the shots cut together, sometimes the look that you set for one shot, oh, it's too saturated or it's too dark in conjunction to the next scene or whatever. So that's really where the fine tuning of the grading process. And of course, being able to control you know, areas of the frame to pick out details from dark areas or, or whatever. And typically, you know, I, I shoot uh, in a way that um, there's detail even in the dark. So we, we shoot to make it be dark, but we do it in a way that there's always that extra little bit in the, in the file, in the, in the actual original uh, camera capture so that if we're in the grade and someone says, hey, can we like lift that? Um, oh, I'm reconnecting on, sorry, I just lost Instagram for a second, but it's back. Um, switch back to me. There we go. Um, but so we generally try and set the shoot in a way that allows us to always have that extra bit of information so that if, if someone, if we lose, if someone says, Hey, can we have a little more definition in the face or whatever it's there. So that's, that's generally the process that Joanne and I go through. And I typically spend a day, day and a half with Joanne for every episode. Um, now in terms of the remote grading, this is something that we've, always been doing, but not quite to the level that we're about to do. And what we were doing in the past was, um, of course, our showrunner, Narain Shankar, he is in Los Angeles, typically. So when we do the, um, the review with him, so Joanne and I will do our full day of work, get the episode looking as best as we can and kind of the where, where we want it to be. The next day or a couple of days later, we do a review with Narain where Deluxe Toronto has a, um, a connection to Los Angeles where Narain can go into the production office in LA, into their offices and sit down in front of a monitor that's calibrated, that looks uh, basically exactly like the monitor that we're looking at. And we have the we have FaceTime on, on my phone and then Joanne and I play the episode and we go through it scene by scene, stopping and starting. And Narain can offer his feedback and comments on, you know, making certain things brighter or the defining parts of the shot, whatever is necessary, but that's all done remotely. And it's a really great process because um, he's seeing what we're doing in real time. So as Joanne makes an adjustment, he sees it happening like less than a second later, depending on the latency. But last year we switched into shooting uh, or finishing rather in HDR. So not only were we 4k, but we were also 4k HDR. So this was a first for us doing remote grading in HDR. So, we, we did that uh, successfully last year, and we're gonna continue to do it this year, which leads me to the process now of how do you deal with color grading when you're self-isolating? So um, having talked with Deluxe in the last couple of days and with Joanne, uh, the process is now that Deluxe is working on moving a system to Joanne's home so that she can work from home. And then myself, the showrunner, our VFX teams are will be set up with a calibrated monitor uh, so that we can be at home doing the same thing, uh, talking about um, talking about uh, basically the grading process remotely in each of our homes. So in, as far as that goes, I'm going to just flick over here because people often ask, what monitor is that? Um, so this is the monitor that I have become accustomed to and a, a huge fan of is the LG series the uh currently it's the c9 it's called the c9 that is what deluxe introduced me to a couple years ago uh it's a 4k oled hdr monitor i believe it's around 900 nits which of course nits is the brightness level that the monitor can show a maximum of and uh so we have had that monitor on set the last couple years as kind of our our hdr like check reference monitor um 
but it's it's an incredible monitor. I mean, I have to say, when you put it up against the Sony like X300, the reference monitor that Joanne uses a lot of post places use it, it's like a forty thousand dollar monitor. It's amazing. It's a four K OLED Sony, unbelievable monitor. But you put the LG C9 next to it, which is like a twenty three hundred dollar monitor or whatever. But you know, it's been calibrated properly, and it's pretty good. Like it's within I don't know fifteen twenty percent or less maybe of of, of overall. Uh, quality, but it's a very good way of, of judging what Joanne is seeing on her $40,000 monitor. So having seen them side by side in the same suite and comparing those two monitors, I know that it's actually really quite good. So uh, what's going to happen now is Deluxe is working to send that monitor to here, to our, our home, so that I can basically be in this room where I am right now uh, with that monitor, which is a 55-inch uh, C9 and work remotely with Joanne to, to watch it. And what, what they're using, I'm gonna just click over here, this device, there we go. It's the, uh, the Streambox Chroma is what Deluxe uses in conjunction with other uh, systems, but uh, one of the things they use and they have been using for a while is something called the, the uh, Streambox. And it's, a, it's an encoding, decoding box that basically sends uh, the picture from Deluxe uh, to wherever it needs to go. So what I'll end up having here is that that box um, which is interesting that it's sort of made this possible that you can now watch uh, you know 4k HDR very uh, low compression low latency uh, at home so in the coming weeks as this gets set up uh, the idea is that we will continue this discussion here I'll come back and talk about it once I have it set up and Joanne is set up in deluxe right now they're really working hard to get all this working so they didn't really have time today to be involved with this conversation um, but we will eventually uh, get into that. I'm going to show it later, uh, how Joanna's set up, how I'm set up uh, here so that I can continue to grade uh, the show even while we're, we're down. Um, so the, the stream box, which is what I'm showing there on my Instagram screen, uh, that is what um, Deluxe uses, and I know it's kind of an industry standard. It's also used for remote sound mixes, so they also do the sound mixes this way. They'll have the 5.1, or now it's Atmos uh, theaters set up where you have this remote um, uh, mixing uh, theater that you could be in one city listening to the mix and someone could be in another city somewhere else listening to it and you're hearing the same thing which is really cool that it applies both to picture and to sound I think that's pretty um, amazing um, so that's what they're working on I'm actually gonna bring in um, an old friend of mine and a colorist that uh, that I've worked with before Mark if you're out there listening I'm gonna give you a call in a second but Mark Cooper is a uh, senior colorist at Technicolor and uh, when Mark saw my post about this, this uh, stream, he messaged me and said, oh, I'm going through the same process right now with Technicolor. And he wanted to, uh, to talk about it. So I said, oh, great. Well, why don't I call you? So I'm going to call Mark right now. Let's see. Let's see if he's, if he's watching. I think he is. Landline. Look at that. Old school. Hello. Mark. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, how are you? All right. Say hi to the internet. Hi, internet. I've been watching it. It's all very fascinating. <laughs> uh, well, this is great. This is a fun uh, topic and, and very timely. And it's funny that when I posted this, you reached out really quickly and said that you were in the process of doing the same thing. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about how that came about and what your, what your process is going to be? Well, I, I've listened to what you're saying, and, and exactly what you described is how we've been, been doing it traditionally, you know, having someone in Toronto, having someone in Hollywood, and they come down and sit and watch it on our fancy monitors. And then, you know, uh, what do you do when, you know, our clients and our artists are at home? So what are we going to do? So, yeah, one way is to use the stream bot, uh, which, which you're, you're doing. And, um, you know, we have a client that's doing that as well. We have the same monitor and stream box. The LG C9? Yeah. Yeah. And the, it, it's, uh, it's one gear at a time though with that, you know, per box sort of thing. So right. It's expensive, right? Um, what we're, we're, we're doing is uh, we have an app called TechStream. So on this app, uh, you can have up to six people join in to do the grading session uh, on their iOS device. Uh, there's two Netflix shows I'm working on that have iPad Pros, uh, 
which we've edited a Technicolor and shipped that to the clients. Um, one shows using five iPads, the other has three. Okay. And uh, it works on your phone. If you have a retina display, the color is pretty good. Um, the app works for VFX sessions, edit sessions, whatever you need. And it's Wi Fi or LTE. Um, so that's what we're trying to do right now. What's the name of that app? It's called TechStream. TechStream, and that's a proprietary Technicolor uh, app? It is. So if you book a session or have a session booked, we'll send you a, an email, you know, confirmation code that you can dial in, and then uh, you're off to the races. That's cool. It's, and it's been working pretty well. You know, like I said, you know, iPad Pros are what, you know, a couple of our clients are, are, are using, and, you know, I looked at them in my room with with the Sony monitor, the X300, and uh, it, it's pretty close, you know? It's just like the C9 is pretty close. These are these are very close, so. That's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So what, how, so as far as, just talk about your at home, because now you're gonna be working from home, so are you, are you, how, what, are you what are you having to set up at, in your home to be able to, to work? Are you basically bringing your console and, and your uh, control surface to your to your home? I am, so I've got, you know, uh, I got that X300, which is now on the A250 Sony, which is the SDR for like the output of the CMU. We need, uh, right. We need a uh, color system, we need panels, we need, um, and a bunch of tech that gets basically my feed out to the, the tech stream app. But that's kind of through tech to color, you know, downtown secure line. Et cetera, et cetera, so. Okay, and and then that um, so basically, you're are you are you actually do you actually have like the server in your house, or are you controlling that remotely? Um, it's going to be a remote thing um, because of the online, you know, uh, content security. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen, so um, I can't really speak to the ins and outs of that, other than the fact that, you know, A, it has to be a secure right. uh, line, and we also need our clients to uh, to get permission for all this, you know, if they want to move forward, it's kind of a, a must-do. Right. Well, because I, I guess this is sort of creating a lot of interesting scenarios where content or, or um, you know, files are being moved out of places where they normally would not be moved just so that people can continue to work. Yeah, I, I mean... It's, it should be business as usual in terms of the, the you know, the experience for the client that way. Um, right. And the security is just being worked out by the people who are, you know, that's their job. So. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, with any remote grading, like if your experience, like it, it's important that I sit down with the clients face-to-face -face for like the first session. Yes. You know, especially if they're, you know, um, new clients, so that might be a sit down in Toronto, or it might be in LA, and then you get a feel for the aesthetic, their working style. You build up a rapport, and then, and after that, the transition to remote creating is easier. Sure. And then we use uh, WebEx or Skype to video chat, and it helps so you can see who you're talking with during the session. Yeah. And um, it makes the distance a little less when you do that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, I mean, I, I guess I'm, you know, in the fortunate situation where Joanne and I have done this for a few years now. So we, you know, we already have that. And, and our showrunner has also been involved with that remotely for the last few years. I mean, he's, you know, we've done so many, I mean, every episode pretty much he's been involved with a remote session. Um, and it's actually gone, you know, pretty well. Like, I, I think that now that we have that kind of workflow established, we actually get through it pretty quickly. And, um, you know, and he's, he's happy and, and he has a very good eye. Like, he's got a really good eye for, you know, black levels and, you know, if there's an issue with it, we actually had a, a problem where we discovered that someone had left the, the C9 in LA on by accident over the weekend on color bars. And, and then he came in, we came in the following week or we, he came in the following week to do a session with us and not knowing that turned it on. And he's like, he's like, I see these like lines. There's like weird lines in the screen. And like, everyone's going like, what, what we, no one could figure it out. And then we realized like, oh my God, it was in color bars for like three days straight. And they had to like do this whole like internal refresh thing which actually worked like there was like a whatever like a factory reset and it, it cleared the, the burn in yeah we, it's occasionally uh, even leaving a slate you know like the show slate 
at the beginning of your timeline up on the screens, you know, it's a big no-no. You know, they have to, I think they wash it with a full white screen for a weekend and then it, yeah. it goes in. But. Yeah, the engineers figured out some, there was some internal thing with turning it off and on a certain way and, it, and it, it, there was like actually an internal like LG like screen refresh that did it. Uh -huh. But um, but yeah, we were like, oh my God, like we're screwed. Like <laughs> now the monitor's dead and that monitor had been like calibrated in Toronto and shipped to LA. So it's like, oh no, we have to like get another monitor and ship it to LA again. It's gonna delay the session by like a week or something, you know. Um, but, uh, oh, there's a question here. Uh, let's see, so it was related to the iPad. Ian is asking, Using iPad Pro and C9 sounds like a great idea, but how are the subtleties addressed? As in, uh, how far should these be trusted? Like things like black levels, compression, noise, et cetera, when colorist, showrunner, and DP are in different rooms? Well, if, if you've had any kind of experience doing the regular remote grading, which is you know, what Jeremy and I are talking about with the, with the higher end version, you know, being TVIPS or, or TechStream, there's still a compression that happens going, you know, up and down the content, but, um, so there's always subtleties, even on the good monitors, um, we're still talking about different grades of monitors, but how the subtleties are addressed are, are pretty much, I have to convince them that it, it is what it is, or that I'm taking care of it, or that they're seeing the proper thing. If I'm reading this correctly, if you're talking about subtleties. I mean, if there's, I'm going to have an iPad Pro with me here as well to see the screen. So it's not just, you know, how is the right the X300 comparing to. So you're watching. You're going to be watching what they're seeing on the iPad Pro while you're working on the X300. Right. So when there's subtleties, you know, we have to talk about it. Say, plus there's a profound difference in watching something that's even 15 inch or whatever. You know, versus 65 inch or, are yeah. versus, you know, a 65 or 55 inch uh, LG screen, right? Sure. So color is the first thing, and then, you know, the, the experience of the size of the screen is the next. But I think that the benefits of, of the portability and the instant nature of it and the cost of it is, um, is worth it. Right. Somebody else is asking, uh, Grant is asking, is there a way to calibrate the iPad to get more accurate color? You know, there, I looked into this because that was my first question. And x ray makes something or some kind of app to do that. But um, I had uh, I mean, nine iPads in my room, you know, uh, this week, like Monday, Tuesday, I was ramping up to get this done. Um, and they all matched very well to each other. So that's the first hurdle because then, you know, you're distributing them to different producers and showrunners that um, they look the same. Um, I didn't investigate any further tweaking mm. uh, away from the factory other than the fact that, you know, we lean on the, the color science guys in Los Angeles to help us out because they always do it before we do it. And they gave us some settings in, inside the iPad to kind of turn on and off and right. brightness levels right. to to start with. Right. Yeah, because you probably you don't you probably don't want to have it. Like I know with my MacBook Pro, when I've compared it to Joanne's monitor, like I I find that it's like five notches down from full brightness is sort of like the right black or brightness level. So that kind of thing. Yeah, and that was fifty percent brightness was the the, the guidance on right. that. Now, if you've ever used an iPad you know that that's not a numeric value, it's like a slider. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you kind of look at them side by side to make sure that they're all, you know, that you're giving it the same numbers. Right. Um, so. But I actually, I see Brian Reed chimed in here on Instagram. He says, we have found differences between exactly the same models. We have sent back a number of them. Right, so that's the other caveat. If you see one that's, and this, this applies for the C9 monitors too, we've had, I mentioned to you the other day that I had Gavin, uh, you know, Smith, we sent him a monitor, but the first one they brought in to send them, we couldn't calibrate, it just wasn't good. And it was more a purity issue left to right. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's, you buy them at the store, check them out. If they're good, great. If not, you send them back. Right. Eric, Eric Whip told me he's like on his fifth one or something because they kind of die after time too. Interesting. 
just from being just from being on like just from being used yeah. right yeah well i guess that makes sense i mean these things that's why it's twenty three hundred dollars instead of forty thousand dollars yeah but still pretty good compared to the well, i don't know what what x 300s are going for these days thirty five thousand or something so. yeah it's like that's a yeah so i mean the bang for the buck is good and at least it's a way of uh affordably sharing um you know sharing screens and plus it's um you know if you're going to consider what consumers are going to watch at home, so probably the best that they can buy for a home right. use. And just because no one's going to have an X300 at home anyway. So. No. Actually, I, it's an interesting question. I should actually just, for anyone who just is tuning in, this is Mark Cooper on the phone with me, who's a, technico a senior colorist at Technicolor. And Mark and I have worked together in the past over many years. So he's uh, chiming in with his thoughts on uh, remote grading. Um, I was going to ask you if this is an urban myth or if this is true that I've heard that Netflix has their own internal um, like grading or uh, like preview streaming preview where you could basically watch your show uh, through Netflix's like compression system to see what it looks like without it actually being live. It's like a kind of like a, like a private um, like streaming preview. Is that true? I've never heard of this. Um, I do know they have, a screening room where they can see HDR, which was, I was um, happy to hear. Uh, I have not heard about this. Um, are, you, are you saying it's a, a streaming slash compression test preview? Yeah, so it's like, a, it's kind of like a, I, this is what I heard. I don't know if this is true. I was called, this, I was heard it was called Alcatraz. And it's uh, that you can basically link the output of whatever your, your platform is to their system. And then it, it feeds through the Netflix compression chain or maybe they take your file and upload i don't know how it works but basically you can then go through like the netflix interface as if you're watching netflix but it's a, it's like a private secret channel that then you can watch your program through that and then see oh the blacks are kind of too compressy or whatever you can kind of make judgments based on on how their compression treats your your blacks and that kind of thing hmm. uh that's very interesting um Traditionally, it's always been a mistake to try and chase down, right? Um, you know, what does it look like on that broadcaster? What does it look like on this broadcaster? Yeah, stick with but, one. I mean, one. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, maybe this is. Um, I don't know. I, I'd like to see if that if that is true. It would be uh, see how useful that is. But uh, I'll ask around. Okay. I, I mean, this is. I heard this is like a rumor, like a year or two ago, and I was like, I've, I've never been able to get anyone to kind of substantiate it. But I thought maybe colorists might know you know if they'd ever heard of it well i'll ask around okay well you know. thanks mark for uh for coming into this and being part of it maybe we can uh you know in the next couple of weeks when everyone's kind of set up we can reconnect and sort of compare uh how everyone's doing with their remote work uh that's a great idea because we are just you know for this level of remote work we're just getting started so i think we'll all have uh some feedback on how well things are working. Yeah, I know. I noticed that Eric Whip actually just posted a uh, he posted a, a picture of his setup in his basement. <laughs> so I think I, I heard. Yeah, I see it. It's uh, I I need to. Uh, I'll get there too and post something. Also, I think um, we'll see how how everyone's internet connection is working. Right. And, and how and how these these um, remote grades are going. And yeah. What, how taxing it is. Yeah. Watch us crash the internet with all this remote work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're gonna break it. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mark. All right, thanks for having me on, Joe. Yeah, likewise. We'll be in touch, and good luck with uh, with getting set up. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. All right, that was Mark Cooper from Technicolor, an amazing uh, colorist who I've worked with uh, many times in the past. I'm just gonna scroll back because there were some questions that came in uh, while we were talking that Christina sent me. Um, okay, this one from Dimitri. Uh, he says, what type of draw would you normally push to grade remotely? How often does the grade uh, and what is done on set to translate to the final look, especially if you cannot attend the grade? Uh, what do you do when you cannot attend a grade? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. I've been in that situation. Um, so typically, I mean, with The Expanse, I've always had the luxury of being there. Uh, I have been on, when I did The Boys uh, and Long Road Home, uh, that color grading happened in the States. Um, and for um, Long Road Home, I was able to do actually Technicolor. Uh, they set me up with a, a room and a monitor, and I was on a speakerphone, and the colorist there um, who did that work 
played back the um, the show, my episodes for me over their calibrated monitor, and I was able to um, give notes and directly and actually have him do it in real time. With the boys, it scheduling didn't work that way so much. Where they basically had to, they they hooked me up again with a, a room where I could go in and look at the the, the episode. But I couldn't, it wasn't interactive with the colors. It was just watch the episode. So I basically was able to just watch it and then make notes on their monitor and then send in my notes, um, which, which also worked because they had kind of taken our on-set look pretty closely and matched it uh, to the final look. But um, I would say that, you know, I've always tried to make it that every, every project I do, I can, I can be involved with the live grading. I think it's very important. If you can't be there, Having the stills, like I was showing earlier, my Flickr gallery, I take the stills from the colorist. I, I put out a, um, a, a, I mean, obviously it depends on the production. Some productions won't allow you to do this because of, uh, you know, uh, intellectual property control and that kind of thing. But for shows that allow me to do it, I will create a private Flickr gallery, post all the stills from the DIT, share it with everybody, editorial, post, production design, you know, makeup, hair, wardrobe, everybody. So everybody can see what everything looks like. And it's a really great way of kind of like, I do it once a week, every Sunday. That's my routine. Um, so I, if I can't be there, then those stills will, uh, will, will make up for that. And generally, it, it is very helpful. Like if you have those stills that you know you're seeing them uh, in a way that represents on a you know, monitor that you know is accurate and that you're, you're happy with, it goes a long way. And, and it usually, if you set the look on set to a, you know, the level that you're happy with, um, typically I find that people can tend to fall in love with that look in the editorial process and the offline process and they, they stick to it and it becomes sort of part of the feel of the show. So, you know, it, it's, if you can't be there in person, then if you, you know, you're not gonna be able to make the final grade, then, then put in that effort or as much as you can to set the look on the day, uh, when you're actually on set, because that ends up carrying through for the next several months that they're looking at the, you know, the rough cuts. So that's that's my advice if you can't if you can't be there. Um, there's another question here. Uh, how do you prepare and create the looks for your productions? Uh, well, um, lately for me, it's been um, obviously a discussion with the director and the production design team, but it's been very helpful having um, concept art. Um, so, which actually leads to a really good point. I brought this book upstairs uh, here with me. That's um, it's it's an Expanse art book, and that book, um, which is right here, is basically full of concept art. And this concept art, here it is. There's the book. There's the book. And this book is full of concept art that we use to basically figure out the look and the feel of every set and scene that we we build. And and the guys at Northfront Studios, Northfront, are super talented um, bunch of designers there they work with us when there's a new set being created and we talk about the tone and the color and the lighting, even the lighting. And they get into wor working out the lighting with, with us and they'll send versions of the drawings and basically I'll go back to them and, you know, make my notes on, on color. So let me find an example here as I scroll through because that really is, is very helpful in terms of um, everybody getting on the same page as far as what the look of something is. And you know the, the just the overall tone, and we've we've actually you know go, gone as far as um, you know making revisions to things. So here's here's an example of concept art. Let's see, can you see it? I'm gonna stand up so I can see it. Properly. There. So like, there's an example of you know that's a look and a feel that we created from scratch. I'll show the Instagram folks over here. So, you know, this, that's an example of, of working with the concept artists to come up with the look and the feel. Um, I'll see if I can find one more example that kind of gives a good sense of it because it's, it's, really, it's really helpful. Oh, here's some really good rough ones. This is from season one. But these, these kind of, um, you know, So that, this is all the work of Northfront um, that gives you a great, I mean, this is pretty much what we ended up going for look-wise. What we ended up with, what you see in these images 
is is very much what the show ended up looking like. You know, as far as the overall tone. Actually, this is a great example. This one here. That's uh, there's Tycho. And you know, our lighting design was pretty much based on working with the concept artists. So you know that that is pretty much what we ended up with in the in the final um, the final thing. But that's you know definitely if you have that kind of uh, you know ability to work with a concept artist, that's great. Or even just photo references, like photo examples of things. That's that's a great thing. Uh, what's the next question here? Kenneth is asking if sending uh, a sorry, it just jumped up. Uh, Kenneth is asking if sending a calibrated monitor to a DP client isn't possible. How is it possible to work remotely? Uh, well, I think I think the best way would be, as Mark was saying on the phone. I mean, things like the iPad and the and the, um, the you know the new Mac laptops, they're quite good. You know, I think I think if you're in a pinch and you couldn't you couldn't actually uh, send them a monitor. I think if you if you were able to send whoever the colorist is, whether it's you, if you're a DP and you're coloring it yourself, if you were able to have the whatever the monitors look, they're going to be looking at, let's say it's an iPad Pro or a laptop, a MacBook Pro, whatever, and you put it next to your monitor and you're able to actually compare it and see the differences, I would say you share, you send them that that device. And basically, you have to have some way of referencing to what you're looking at. So you've got to put it next to whatever your, your reference monitor is. So I would say that would be, I guess, the best case scenario for in a situation where you don't have like a properly calibrated monitor. Um, someone is saying, oh, Jason. Jason is asking, COVID subs, uh, after COVID subsides, do you think that this will become more common uh, to work more remotely? I think yes. Uh, I think for sure this is, I mean, already the industry has been doing it because the film industry is already used to working remotely. Like all these companies, Deluxe, Technicolor, they all have, they all do remote sessions, both for sound mix and for color. And it's a, it's a very common thing. Uh, in the VFX side of the world of things, there's um, a, a program called CineSync, which if you haven't heard of that, um, VFX teams use it. And it's a great tool for um, strategizing and planning uh, shots where basically you can share an image where everyone can be seeing it and you can draw on the image and make notes of like, you know, move this thing here or, you know, whatever, and everybody can see what you're drawing on it. So I think things like CineSync, we're already working remotely anyways. I think we're going to see more working remotely uh, kind of thing. Our industry was already kind of set up for it in some ways. Now we're moving to a more extreme level, but with people working in LA and New York and Toronto and all over, often you've got key creatives in different cities that are that are doing things in different places. So it's a, it's I think it's already a common thing, and certainly we're we're going to see more of it. Um, Mark, asking about how do you feel about using and creating lots on set and sending it to the color for further use? Um, I say yes. I I think that's a good thing, and I I already do that, and I think it's a great way to kind of get started, so that when you walk into that color suite in the final uh, grade, you're already kind of halfway there. I think for sure, um, I say yes, you know. Mario is asking for advice on DPing his first sci-fi short film genre. Uh, maybe, Mario, maybe maybe be, ask me more, more specific as far as like what, you're, what you wanna know. It's a big, it's a bitty broad topic that I could go off into many <laughs> directions with. So if you got a second, you could you could write in. I don't know what, where you are if you're in uh, Instagram or Facebook. I've kind of I've kind of covered a lot of the things I wanted to talk about. So um, I'll kind of maybe just stay open for a bit if anyone has any other questions. But I, I think I covered a lot of the things I wanted to to you know update on the CSC and with um, with both and with color grading. Um, ah, Benji is asking, how do you control multiple versions of monitors on set? Well. Uh, I would say here's what my take on it is, um, I worry about the two monitors that are, that I'm looking at, which are the, my DITs monitors. Those are like the hero monitors. Everything else is kind of like secondary and you know, the other people on set are not usually particular about what they're seeing on those monitors. What I typically do very simply is, you know, I make sure I ask to make sure that all the monitors on set are OLEDs so that we're all looking at you know, OLEDs. If you have a mix of, LCD and OLED, it's really hard to kind of like compare black levels and stuff. So I, I, try, I try to make sure that 
Video Village, any other monitors that are being used, you know, by client or producers um, are, uh, and the directors are OLEDs. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at our DITs monitors. Those have been calibrated. I'm, I'm confident with those. And then, um, and then I go to, I'll walk around the set and I'll look at like, okay, let's go to Video Village and look at their monitors. And I've literally, you know, I've got in my brain fresh, I've just looked at the, the DITs monitors. Then I go over to Video Village and I look at those monitors. And if they look too bright, too saturated, whatever, I'll, I'll kind of just by manually dial them a little bit to make them look like what the DITs monitors look like. And I think that's, otherwise you're getting into like, you could calibrate everything, but often it's not possible to calibrate every single monitor because often you'll end up with like, you know, some splinter unit or other thing comes up and another monitor is brought in from, you know, the rental house that's never been calibrated. Um, you know, thankfully monitors these days are generally kind of very uniform or as a you know, general rule, like, you know, all the Sony's are kind of generally Sony like. So if your DIT monitor looks a little brighter, darker, then I would just go to each monitor and just tweak it. Um, and that's kind of, that's sort of my approach to dealing with different monitors on set. Uh, Daniel, what do you think of the new cheaper anamorphic lenses like Atlas Orion? Um, and what are you using on your sets, lens, camera, package? Well, that varies a lot, but I would say I, we, I and we really like the Atlas Orion lenses. Um, I know a lot of our DP friends like them. We use them on Expanse for season five. Um, you know, they're not the sharpest lenses in the world. Uh, they're also not as distorted as some other anamorphic lenses are. So they, they aren't as distorted. They're a little bit softer. They have a little more character in that way. I like them for that reason. Um, and we use them on season five. I've always had the Cook S5s as, as kind of our hero lenses. And we've been mixing up the Cook S5s with anamorphics. Season four, it was Cook anamorphics. This season, it was, it was um, Atlas anamorphics. So I think they're great. They're great value for the money. It's, they're kind of an affordable lens to add to your package if you want to carry anamorphics in addition to another set of lenses without being super expensive. Um, you know, they have their limitations. They have some weird flares sometimes. Uh, you know, the, the, I guess from set to set, they're all a little different like most lenses, but I think with the, you know, with the, with the atlases, they vary a little more when you compare set to set, you know, and I think that's just, you know, due to the nature of the fact that they're a little more affordable and that's kind of, I guess what you might expect with lenses that aren't as expensive. Um, but yeah, the Cook S5s are kind of my go-to lens. Um, but now there's so many type of lenses coming out that it's, you know, I'm actually waiting for Zero Optic in, uh, in LA is rehousing a set of my old Nikon lenses, which I can't wait to get those. It's, I've, you know, these are the lenses I've had since I was like a teenager almost, and they're now going to be in a new PL mount and proper mechanics and, uh, new irises and all that. So that I'm hoping that they, I expect them sometime in the next few months. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Ash asking now that your show is an HDR, uh, how has your ideology changed behind lighting restrictions? Um, that's an interesting question. And I know, I know a lot of people have different, uh, opinions on HDR and how to, um, use it on set. I find that, um, the, trick th the tricky thing with HDR is if you have HDR monitors on set, the problem is, is that really the control of HDR for me is, is in post. Because if you're on set and you have an HDR monitor, and we do have one, we have the LG C9 on set as kind of like a reference that we kind of keep off to the side and we don't always bring it out. We have our Sony, or sorry, um, uh, our DIT Rainey, uh, she had her, um, her um, Flanders Scientific 25-inch OLEDs calibrated. Um, those monitors uh, are not HDR and we would look at everything in SDR because if you have an HDR monitor on set, the thing about HDR is that unless you, unless you're actually like grading it and controlling it shot to shot, everything that's bright, like the bright white things are going to be like full brightness, like a thousand nits or whatever. And it's really distracting to try and light with that. It's kind of goes back to like, I remember um, Michael Mann when he shot, I think it was uh, collateral that that was like the, like the Viper camera. And he specifically had non HDR monitors on set cause he didn't want people to get like fixated on the HDR ness or sorry, HD ness of, of, of that technology, like way back then. Um, so I, I, uh, I find that with HDR, I like looking at an SDR image on set, have the HDR monitor off to the side that you can look at, but you have to know 
that it's full pop, it's full bang, unless you're going to go to the trouble of literally live grading every shot in HDR to put the, the highlights where you want them and the saturation where you want them. It's, that's not really practical when you're on set live. So it hasn't really changed the way I light on set other than that I'm, I'm conscious of things like, you know, obviously our sets and our show are a lot of um, practicals, exposed practicals and LED that's exposed in, you know, in the walls and the ceilings and stuff like that. And sometimes, you know, when they're with HDR, those things that are in SDR aren't normally that bright or distracting can now become really distracting and compete with the actors' faces. So I've, I've found that I'm like knowing that and having been in the color suite in HDR, I'll, sometimes I'll tone those things back. I'll pull back things in the background that I know in HDR are going to be a problem. But the thing is, is that I, I'm, I, I'm consciously thinking that I'm looking at this in SDR on set, but when I get into uh, the final grade, I'm going to pull things back and control them. You know, Joanne and I can, can selectively grab things in the shot. Um, like for example, like that bright thing back there, like, you know, that is roasty hot, but I know that in HDR, if, as long as I'm not clipping the highlights and that's the important thing, as long as I'm not clipping the highlights, I can pull that thing back. So I'm, I'm kind of like, if that thing, if that light needs to actually be a light source and throw light into the shot, I'm not going to dim it down to the point where in HDR it looks good because then it's not lighting the shot anymore. So it's finding that balance of, of making sure you don't clip the highlight that you can still control it in the grade and that it's that, you know, knowing that you're going to be able to control that later. So if you look at it on set in HDR monitor, it's going to look like crazy bright. And if, if you look at that all day, it's going to drive you crazy. So I would rather look at SDR on set knowing that I'm going to have that control later. So I hope that answers that question. Um, uh, John is asking, can you talk about compression is handled at the broadcast end? Uh, that's tricky because I don't know a lot about that. Um, it's not something I really deal with per se. And, you know, as Mark mentioned on the, on his call earlier, it's really best not to chase that dragon in that sense. Like stick with your hero reference monitor, look at that and don't, uh, don't try and think about what the compression is going to do later. Because otherwise, you know, so I, I don't really get into to trying to think about that too much because it's kind of beyond my control. And there's so many ways of things being compressed that really you have to focus on your hero thing, your hero image, and know that that's what you're trusting. Um, Adam is asking, what do you use as your onboard monitor? Um, I don't really use one anymore. <laughs> I don't, because I don't really operate much. I own a couple of, um, small HDs and that's sort of become the thing, but I don't, um, I, I don't use one so much on set cause I'm not really operating as much. So, but for personal use, we have our own C200 here at home and we shoot our own products with it. And we have, a, uh, I think it's the, uh, it's the, the OLED, the first OLED small HD that came out. I mean, I know there's better ones now, but for me, that's fine. I'm not really using it to judge that much. Um, and I know there's a lot of opinions on, on, uh, onboard monitors. So I, I don't want to, way too far into that um let's see uh jordan is asking do you shot this extensively uh with being on a vfx heavy show like the expanse um uh yeah yes we do it depends on the sequence but anything that's quite complicated uh technically we will um we will storyboard and shot list it pretty heavily um and we go through you know basically it's a sequence that involves a lot of elements because often we shoot elements that are that are not shot at the same time in different stages, different, you know, full set, some blue screen, and they all end up getting tied together. That's stuff you really have to go through because sometimes you're shooting a shot where the camera's like this, and then it's going to be comped into a shot where the camera's like that, and the actor has to be this way, and then in the other shot, they're like this. So that has to be planned out so that you know that you're shooting everything at the right angle and that the sun is from here, and then in this shot, the sun is from here, and it has to all line up. So that stuff for sure we, we plan out. And, you know, VR has become a big help for us in that way. We use VR with, in conjunction with our art department. The sets are designed in 3D, obviously. They get imported into a VR program, and then we can go in with the goggles and the controller and like literally be in the room in the set in 3D virtual space and plan stuff out that way. Um, we can also um, uh, take pictures in there with a director's finder that shows us the actual lenses that we're using so you can change between wide, you know, 18, whatever our set of lenses are and take pictures that then become like your virtual storyboards. And then we'll hand those images to the storyboard artist and say, look, here's all the shots in this set. 
this is the sequence. Now they have to just add the people into it. And it's really helpful for stunts and VFX to know where the rigging is going to go, what part of the set has to be removed to get the wires in or whatever. So to answer that question, yes, definitely uh, we shot list and we plan that stuff extensively because time is of the essence when you're in, in television. Um, Scott, Scott McClellan. Hey, Scott. He's asking, do you have any secrets for making the time uh, to spend with you? Sorry, let me reread that. Do you have any secrets for making the time to spend with you, your DIT on set? This is always a challenge for me as I feel as though I'm never able to take the best advantage of having there as I'm constantly being pulled in other directions. Um, yeah. Well, for me, I've, I've usually, I've usually kind of, as getting into the rhythm of this kind of thing, um, I would say, uh, I would basically spend time with them at the end of the day and go through the looks uh, and set it up it kind of like knowing that as you're working throughout the day, you have kind of a base look and then you dial it in at the end of the day and then set the look at the end of the day. If you're, if you're, if it's a really crazy day and you're, you're constantly being pulled in different directions, as you say, then I would, I would basically um, work at a base level knowing roughly what your look is. And then at the end of the day, you spend like that 45 minutes and go through with them shot by shot and just get the look kind of dialed in. Um, you know, that, that for me is, is, is helpful. Josh, do you think, monitor tech is going to fully shift towards OLED pure blacks worried about what the average viewer LCDs are seeing. Um, I mean, I would, I would say it's going that way. It seems like it is becoming an OLED pure black world. And I think that's what the future of all monitors are. So, um, it's, um, unfortunately, I think that's the case. I think we have to kind of plan for that. I think that is the future of, of, um, of view of watching. Uh, anything it now is going to be the pure black OLED look, which, you know, is a challenge if you're going for a flatter low con look, but I think that's kind of becoming the thing um, in general. So yeah, I think we have to plan for that. I think that's, I think I've covered everything. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's been a pretty good uh, talk. Oh yeah. John Holosco. Someone's saying that the 55 inch is now on sale. Yes. You can find that on sale. Costco often has them too. Costco is definitely a, a good place to check for that. Compare it to uh, Amazon or, or um, Best Buy. What got me into sci-fi production? Uh, well, I certainly didn't expect it. I got into it. Um, I hadn't done sci-fi until Expanse, and it was actually Manny Danilon, um, our producer, who called me out of the blue in 2014 or fifth, whatever it was before season one started in the summer. And it was um, John DeBoer and Rob Sim of Sim Digital at the time uh, had given uh, my name to um, to Manny because they were looking for a DP. They had lunch. They were describing what they were looking for. Or Manny was describing what they were looking for for the show. And I guess they felt that my name I was that I fit that description. So um, I got the call and I went in for an interview. I didn't expect when I heard about the show and I looked at their like lookbook that Weta had created, it was amazing. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't have the credits to show I could do this, but they liked my work. They believed in what I did. They liked my documentary and mixed kind of background. And that was what got my foot in the door, I guess. And it, the interview went, went, went well. And the guys at Alcon, Andrew and Broderick, um, you know, we, they talked to me and they, they, you know, had confidence and Terry McDonough, the director, uh, of the beginning of the of the first season was a fan, you know, and I had never met him before. Um, and that was kind of how it started. And, you know, <laughs> now here I am uh, five seasons into sci-fi and now, you know, people think like I'm the sci-fi guy, you know, but it, I didn't really start that way. It was just, uh, I was sort of sucked into it. Let me flash the emails one more time before we go. So this is the uh, Arthur Gallagher email for uh, CSC uh, members there. Keep that in mind. There it is over there. Right. And this one that fell. There we go. There you go. Uh, one more question is coming in. And of course, check out 
the newest magazine. There it is. With Batwoman on the cover. Great cover. Hats off to Yannick Lowe, the photo editor, for these great covers. There we go. Okay. Uh, is it Jan or Yan? I'll, one of the two. Um, is asking, what do you depend on most from your camera operators? Uh, do they help design shots? Um, yes. Well, I should talk about... Um, so Jason Vieira is my uh, A camera operator, and Jason and I have worked together for many years. Um, and, you know, he's... The transition for me into television <clears throat> was something where, you know, I used to operate all the time. I was an operator. I was a steady cam operator for a long time. Uh, learning how to disconnect myself from being the operator. On, on, a, on a larger show, you basically, you can't, you can't operate really yourself because there's, you know, there's too much going on. You have to kind of delegate that and you have operators working for you, you know, typically an A and a B camera. So um, I would say, uh, you know, having those operators that you trust are, are extremely, uh, it, it's a great part of the, of, of, the, of the job, you know, I mean, having, working together with someone like Jason, um, you know, he's super talented. You know, we've worked together for so long. He knows my thinking. He has his own style. Uh, working with an operator like that where it, it really frees you as a DP because now you can you can get involved with the shot with the director, the blocking, you work it all out, and then you can step away and not have to worry about the minutia. Once you've figured out what the broad strokes of the shot are, you don't have to be dealing with those those little details because those operators and their team of the, the dolly grips and, and everyone as a team are making those shots happen. And then you can go back to lighting because, you know, time is of the essence, especially in television. You've got to get that shot going as fast as you can. So um, I really value that ability to, um, to work with those operators that are talented and, and that you, you have that trust. I mean, you, you, you want to build that rapport with, with someone. And, and there's a lot of great operators out there. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to have uh, Jay and, you know, with Kevin Jewison has been with us. Uh, we had Eric Gerard this year. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's great having that team of like, it's a family thing. It's a, it's a creative mutual, um, discussion. Um, so, uh, yes, I would say that, you know, I just want to make sure I answer the question fully. Um, what do I depend on most from the operators? Well, I think really it's that trust. I depend that they're, you know, that they're, they're going to work with the actors. I mean, the operator is such a key person on the set. They are, they are basically the eyes of the set when you step away to go work on lighting or whatever they are um they are making sure that the you know the, the extras are in the right place that the set dressing is in the right place that there's no technical problems with the reflections of boom mics or any of that kind of stuff you know you really want them to to be those eyes for you and, and you depend on them for that to make sure that while you're working on getting the shot lit that they're looking out for all those little details that are going to be like, oh, we got the shots not working because, you know, that person's in the wrong spot or the, the chair in the background is in a weird play, whatever. All those little things that you end up kind of fighting in the frame, that's what a good operator does, and that's what uh, my team does, you know. Um, and, yes, they certainly help design shots. I mean, they often, you know, the shot will start as one thing, we, we work it out, you'll go away, work on the lighting, and then they're ready to show you like a second team rehearsal with the stand-ins. And it'll be like, hey, look, I've, I've managed to like, I've made this shot work into like two things. Now there's like, it's this shot that we talked about and I've made it kind of do this as well. That's what you get with, you know, a good, a good collaborative operating team is that they make the idea of the shot, they improve upon it. And the shots are, are better, which, you know, that's, that's great. It makes all of us uh, look good and, 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 you know, feel like we're part of that, that creative team. You know, the directors, directors love that. They want to see that kind of initiative from their operators. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I can kind of wrap it up here. I can say that, you know, for anyone who's not already a CSC member that, you know, now's a good time to join. Um, you know, you can find links to, uh, on the, the original website still has links to how to join, what the different levels of membership are, you know, the benefits, are kind of things that I've already been talking about here. Um, follow us on Instagram. We have our uh, Instagram, which you're already following it over here. But for those people over there on Facebook who aren't following it, uh, we also have our Twitter feed. So tune in next week. Look for uh, Boris Majowski and Brandon Stacy. Thursday, one o'clock. They're going to be talking about uh, co DPing um, uh, Titans together. So that's going to be a really cool conversation. I'll be watching from the sidelines, and uh, we'll come back. 
in a few weeks and we'll have another discussion about remote grading. Once I have it set up here and Joanne is set up, we'll have a, another discussion about how that's working. Um, and you know, and as Mark mentioned earlier, maybe we can bring Mark back and have that discussion too. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'll see you soon. Stay well, make sure you get fresh air once in a while and be creative. Don't let this time get you down, you know, um, do the things you always wanted to do. So I will see you all soon. Enjoy the rest of the day. Wait, over here. Goodbye, all. See you soon.